Mark chapter 10. We find here, of course, uh, a story that we're all familiar with, or we'll look at that in just a minute. I, I love Mark chapter 10 and verse number 1, uh, just how the Lord is so patient to teach, so patient with us, um, just, uh, just working with... Look, look verse 1, Mark chapter 10, verse 1. He arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resorted unto him again. I've circled that word again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. Just how the Lord takes the time teaching them. Notice verse 10. And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. <laughs> how many times you've had to been told, you know, you said to your kids, how many times have I told you? God, I'm sure wants to say that to us sometimes. How many times have I told you, right? Again, but he's patient with them. We're going to begin tonight where we're looking is verse 17, where we'll read. Did you notice with me there? We're going to read through verse 31. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came out one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I obtained from my youth. Interesting, he dropped the good part. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying. And went away greed, for he had great possession. Some people wonder why Jesus said he had to give away all his goods. Can I say this? God has not told every person that comes to him to do that. But there was one idol standing between him and receiving the Lord as his Savior. There was one thing, one idol that could not continue. He cannot worship God and mammon. He had to make a choice, and God knew what his idol was. It was covetousness. It was things. It was riches. And he could not serve God unless he was willing to yield all that to the Lord. I think if he had been willing to do it, God would have done exactly like he did for Job. I think he would have done what he did for others but because the riches had a hold of him god knew he had to let that go if he's going to serve me verse 23 and jesus looked around about and said to his disciples how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of god the disciples were astonished at his words but jesus answered again and saith unto them children how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of god it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. I think the disciples lived in astonishment, you know. Verse 24, they were astonished. Now they're astonished out of measure. They're beside themselves at wit's end, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them, beholding them, I think in a similar manner as verse 21, with grace, with mercy, with compassion, with love, patience, saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed, have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There's no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake in the Gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now, in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. We'll bring a message entitled, Jewels, over Jesus. This rich young ruler chose jewels 
over Jesus. Verse 24, the Lord points out this trust in riches. He says, as he's clarifying to the disciples as they ask, but Jesus answered again, verse 24, and say to them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? See, money's not the root of all evil, the love of money. Riches aren't evil, but the trust, God's pointing out, they that trust in riches. So you don't have to be rich to trust in riches. How hard is it for Christians that trust in riches to serve God and have Christ's spirit, you know, to really have an abandonment to true reality. Uh, What is really where we're living many times is what is a perceived reality. It's the reality that the world's living in. That life is about uh, having things and being comfortable and uh, not having a, the problems of this world. And life is about a, a certain level of comfort and, and, and just ease. And that's what we're living for, to have those things. But life's not about any of that. Life's not about the things that we see. The things that we see, the Bible says, are temporal. They're going to burn up. They're going to fade. Life is about what we cannot see, the eternal. And the devil is, many times with Christians even, got our eyes distracted from the true riches, from the riches the Lord Jesus was offering this man. If he would say, come, you'll have treasures in heaven. Don't worry about all the treasures of the earth. Let that go. Come follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. And the man couldn't see it. Many times Christians are not seeing that. God stirred me today. I read this letter. I think maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was this morning. I think it was yesterday. The Lord really stirred me up. This is our mission missionary to Central Asia. I'll call his name later after we're not on live stream. But if you know who that is, you'll, you, if not, you'll, you'll figure it out. But our missionary to Central Asia, he wrote this letter, and I want to read it to you. It so stirred me. Would you listen with your heart? 2 Timothy 2, 4, he starts with, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Let's be honest, I've been guilty and Many Christians are guilty. That's right where we're at. We're entangled with the affairs of this life. You know how much time it takes to have things? You know how much time we spend on our house and our cars and our keeping up all our things? We're entangled with things. And it's costing us life that is so precious and used to be used for the eternal. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen to be a soldier. Here's what he writes. We're in a war. It's vicious. If you don't know where Central Asia he's talking about is, it's uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. These are all just north of Iran and Pakistan. We're in a war. It's vicious. Forget blood and death. This war is for eternal souls of men. Think of that. We think about blood and death war, but he says, forget that. That's nothing. This is for the eternal souls of men. We face an enemy that is smarter than we are more powerful than we are, and who fights with no illusion, reservation, or mercy. He wants to see us ruined, defeated, or useless, and the lost souls around us deceived and sealed in their error. It's a war on every front. It rages day and night in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our society. Its battles are fought in the minds of each person. There's no rest from it. No escaping it. You are either defeated or victorious. There are no stalemates. See, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. The battlefield is in the minds. It's not the things that are seen. Arrayed against us are the forces of Satan, using our thoughts, desires, and fears against us. He distracts and deceives His objective is to lead us away from obeying our Lord and to deceive our children away from the truth. If he is successful, souls are damned to a burning hell forever, lost with no hope of ever coming back. If he is defeated, then they enter the joy of eternal fellowship with the God that made them forever safe, forever blessed. We're ordered to put on our armor and fight. Our weapons are spiritual. Our swords are words, truths, facts, information with these words from God. We can inform, enlighten, and win the battle. Satan is beaten by the word of God when it is lived and taught to people who are in the valley of decision. The devil has convinced millions of God's children, God's warriors with unlimited potential, that their calling on earth is to make a good living. 
achieve a high level of comfort and to attend church on Sunday. A thousand times no. It is the height of spiritual immaturity to think that God calls anyone to stand on the sideline while this war is raging on all sides of us. You are called to fight with every resource at your disposal. Anything less is disobedience. Anything less is shirking our duty. We have a simple plan here in Central Asia to attack, attack, and attack again. We plan to invade the enemy's territory on every side. We plan to establish permanent bases of the truth, permanent lighthouses of the gospel in every dark region of Central Asia if God grants us the time and health. We do not plan to sit on our laurels, but to push deeper and deeper in the enemy's territory until God orders our hearts to stop beating. Now, they've been over there 10 plus years. They're not just talking about it. They've been there, been planting churches. Pictures here of some of their churches in a room about the size of my office, and then people sitting on the floor, not kids, but grown people, older people, sitting for church in a small room on the floor. We do not plan to defend our, our territory, but to make the enemy defend his. Why wouldn't we? We cannot be beaten as long as we obey. In January, we will be res- restructuring our church plants and administration to attack in another direction. Our plan is for the next five years to focus the majority of our efforts on the vast unreached area of Kazakh- Kazakhstan in North Central Asia. Everything in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan will continue as before, but our hearts are burdened when we look at the map and see large areas of Central Asia with no established churches in city after city after city. Why are these regions still so dark? Is God at a loss? Is he bankrupt? Does he not have children he can send soldiers who will invade Satan's territories? We must conclude that he has called many, but they have refused to go. They've been too busy, deceived into thinking that it is not their responsibility. We plan to do what we can until we can't anymore. Come, go with us. Don't don't come if you insist on soft beds and entertainment. Come if you're determined to use your life, strength, and gifts as weapons in the war for men's hearts. Come if the knowledge of cities, towns, and villages, city and darkness burdens you and convicts you. Come if you believe that God cares for them more than you care for your own children. Come if your conscience will not let you stay away. The past few months have been eventful. One evangelist was beaten in front of his family. One church plant basically fell apart because all the people attending had to move to other areas to find work to feed their families. One city has nine adults begging us to come. Another has seven adults asking us to teach them, but we can't yet. We work and we train men and women to go as quickly as we can. There are needs on every side and not enough hours in a day. We're only so many and so limited. Our hearts are heavy with the opportunities that we cannot take advantage of. Oh, we need wisdom. Two newsletters ago, I shared with you the testimony of Maria. Born again at 82 years of age, she became very ill in September. The evangelist went to see her. She could not rise from her bed, but she asked them to read to her from the scriptures about heaven. They read to her for a few hours from the book of Revelation. Shortly after they left town, that blessed lady saw heaven for herself. She entered the presence of her Savior a few weeks ago. Her short battle is over, and she won. She left this life with guns blazing, calling people to her home and witnessing to them. One lady trusted Christ at Maria's bedside. She couldn't leave the house, but she's calling people to come so she can witness. I hope you realize that without you, without your prayers and your giving, she probably would not have had that chance. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. One day you will be personally rewarded for Maria and hundreds of others just like her. Isn't that something to put a spring in your step? Not only do we get to go to heaven for free, but we also get a reward for every obedience and sacrifice. In October, Brother Enver, our first male convert, And the Fergana Valley also joined the saints at the foot of the throne. He went from an alcoholic to a faithful child of God. After receiving the gospel, he attended every meeting at the Kokoreta church plant, always arriving with his notebook ready and always sitting beside me, asking me to repeat things to him that he couldn't hear. He went from guzzling vodka 
to loving the Lord Jesus Christ. His presence and enthusiasm will be missed. I'll never forget after he trusted Christ how he came up to me and said, Spasibo, which means thank you. You'll meet him one day. He probably will tell you the same. Thank you. Pray for this other family that's coming. They need wisdom as they prepare to move their family here next year. They'll be moving from Kyrgyzstan to Kyrgyzstan from Florida. Reinforcements. We believe that God is sending help as we prepare to expand. Step out of, step out of the boat by faith, and you will discover that even water will hold you up. We feel that God has taken the ministry to a new level. 2,000 years ago, God died on the cross to bring his creation back to himself. 33 and a half years before that, he joined humanity in the womb of a young woman. Most of the world has no idea. We know what happened. We know what it means. Is it right for us not to tell the world? Don't they have a right to know? Is it right for us to worry more about comforts and pleasures than the eternal souls of men? Let's open our eyes. The gospel tells us how to live. Pretty powerful. Quite a letter. Made me think, how's my love for him? How's your love for him? Oh, he loves us. The Lord Jesus didn't think about his comfort, didn't think about his concerns when he left heaven. He came to this world. We're talking about this man here in Mark 10 that chose jewels over Jesus, but God chose the cross over his crown. He left his crown to take the cross for me and you. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior tonight, I'll tell you, come to know him. He loves you. He died for you. But oh, for all of us that know him here, may God help us to be a witness for him. I want to thank you for sitting with the children on Sunday as we had them in here on the first week and some of these children we've adopted that ride the Sunday school buses and vans. The Bible says here that he looked on this young man and he beheld him. Look look at verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. I don't know if you beheld those kids. I hope you did. Did you behold them? What will you do? See, love, love acts. The Lord looked at him and he beheld him and he, he loved him. Jesus offers the rich young ruler... Pretty amazing here, the same offer he offered the disciples. He says, go take care of your stuff, get all that liquidated, get it sold, give it away, and then come, take up your cross, follow me. Quite an offer. Peter knew what he offered, because look at verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and have followed thee. See, Peter's saying, he didn't leave his stuff. But we did. We left our lucrative business. We left what we were doing, and we left it all and followed you. Our ships, our fishing, we followed you. That's the same thing God was offering them, this man. I see two things tonight. Quickly, our time's gotten away. Number one, a love of comfort. A love of comfort. Materialism, the love of money. We see here in this man, that was his issue. From Matthew, from Mark, from Luke. If you read the accounts about this rich young ruler or other places called this lawyer, he had inherited this wealth. That's why he was rich and young. Isn't it funny you ever see a Corvette or a, uh, one of these uh, um, you know, sports cars and it's always an old person getting out of it because <laughs> they're the only ones that can afford it, right? So if a young person has one, you know it wasn't because of him. Uh, he inherited it, right? That's this man. He's inherited this wealth. He's inherited this position. He's inherited influence. All the things that people covet, this young guy had it. But he had not inherited eternal life. So you can't can't inherit that from your parents. You've got to get that directly from the source. God didn't have any spiritual grandkids. So as rich as he was, truly he was poor in reality. And as great as he was, he was lost, the Bible says. He left the Lord lost. See, money won't buy true riches, not the true riches, not what really matters. I read this, I thought it was good. Money will buy a bed, but it will not buy sleep. Money will buy food, but it will not buy an appetite. Talk to someone today that has a problem, can't, has trouble eating the appetite. Money will buy medicine, but it will not buy health. Money will buy a house, but it will not buy a home. 
Money will buy a diamond, but it will not buy love. Money will buy a church pew, but it will not buy salvation. So Jesus is inviting this man to get rid of this idol, that which stood between him and God. And he says, no, I'll keep my jewels and I'll leave Jesus. The Bible says he left him grieved. It's interesting, in verse 18, he calls him good master. Verse 17, good master. And Jesus asks him a question about that. Why callest thou me good? Now, they would not have called the rabbis good. No, they didn't use that term good for anyone but God. They all knew that. That was common knowledge. So the, this young ruler is, is trying to flatter him, saying, good master. And Jesus knows he is God. That's not a problem for you to call me good. But I just want to know, do you know I'm God? Are you admitting that I am the Son of God? Are you owning me as your Savior? And so he asks this question in verse 19. And of course, the, the, or this question, verse 18, and then he gives them the commandments here. It explains why Jesus pointed the young man to these commandments, because the, the law of Moses here is a mirror. Are you recognizing that you are standing before God? Are you a sinner, dirty, recognizing yourself in front of the mirror and bowing as a sinner before the Son of God. So he lists these commandments. These commandments have to do with your neighbor, which is interesting. He mentions all these things. He says, no, I've done all that. He's, I've not committed adultery. I've not killed. I've, I've not stolen from my neighbor. I've not uh, defrauded or lied. I've not stolen, not bear false witness, not, not lied. God says, well, if you love your neighbor, then show it by selling these things. Pretty interesting. Verse 20, he says, just master. So he indicates <clears throat> evidently that what we see by the end of the story, that he was not recognizing him as God, just flattering him because he leaves off good. Verse 21, the Bible says, then Jesus beholding him, loved him. That word beholding there means to look in, to fix your eyes upon, to look intently it means to know someone or something by inspection. So God looked upon him, and he looked deeply on him. He looked beyond the skin surface, what we could see. He looked and saw his heart. And though he saw him as he truly is, like he sees you and me, yet still he loved him. Loved him right where he was. And he didn't say, oh, you're doing pretty good, keep it up. He knew what this man needed and said the truth. He sees his heart. John Phillips wrote this. In effect, Jesus said to him, you lack reality, young man. I quoted to you the 7th, 6th, 8th, ninth, and 5th commandments. These commandments have to do essentially with your behavior toward your fellow men. With your professed safeguarding of the well-being of others, he said from his youth up, you want to do, quote-unquote, do something to inherit eternal life? This is what you have to do. Love poor people as God loves them, as I love them. You say that you have always kept these commandments. We'll prove it. Invest everything you have in them. You'll have treasure in heaven. Oh, and there's one more thing. I'm on my way to a place called Calvary, there to die on a cross. I invite you to come to take up the cross and follow me. A strong language, a strong medicine, no doubt, that the Lord says. It was more than the young man had bargained for. Obviously, he came, notice verse 17, he came how? Running. See there? He comes up running. He's in a hurry to have God. He's in a hurry to have eternal life. He, he wants it now, and he's running to it, but he didn't leave that way. The Bible says he left grieved. Grieved. Verse number 22. Went away grieved. We're grieved as the idea of storm clouds brewing. He's grieved. He went away broken. Instead of owning Jesus as Lord and Savior, investing all his in, in, in investing his all in eternal treasure, eternal life, he turned his back on Jesus and went away. Think about it. He went home still owning his jewels, still owning his treasure, still owning his wealth, but he did not own Jesus. God wants us to take Jesus as our Savior. He, he is offering himself to us and we can have him, belong to him and him to us. He says he'll come to live with us, take up his abode in us. We have him, eternal life the eternal one living within us. That man owns so much, but that's one thing he didn't have. He left the Lord. 
walked away. As far as we know, that's the last time he ever was in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He chose jewels over Jesus. Peter, you're worried about what you're going to have at the end of the passage. The rich man owned his riches, but Peter, you have Jesus. You've chosen and you have Jesus. Say, what happened to this rich young man? Well, I don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't say, but perhaps he's the rich man in Luke 12. That looks over all his stuff and his barns are so full now he can't hold it and says, I'm going to pull it down and build greater. And God says, thou fool, this night. Maybe it's that rich man. Or maybe it's, he's the rich man in Luke 16. But Lazarus laid at his gate, remember? And the Bible says he died and in hell lifted up his eyes, being in torment. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Could be. That's where he ended up. Verse 23, I want you to notice the Bible says, And Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter in the kingdom of God? Now, I want to bring this home. We talked about the rich man. But the truth is, if you live in America, you're a rich person. We're all rich. None of us went to a well today and pumped water. None of us had to walk down, carry a pot, and get water. Uh, we all got here on, not by horse or by walking. We got here in some type of vehicle. Uh, we're, we're rich people. You say, well, you don't know how little I have. We're rich people. You live in America. You have opportunity that we nowhere else has. Many other places in the world, a large percentage of the world doesn't have. I want to hear Jesus' warning now. Now he's teaching. Here's the rich young ruler. Here's your example. Here's your illustration. Here's your visual aid. Now Jesus brings it home for you and me. Verse 23, Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? The disciples are astonished at his words. So Jesus now narrows their focus and helps to define what he's saying. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it's impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Here's the Lord warning about riches. There are two worlds that you can live for. It's evident right from the very beginning of Scriptures, before you get past Genesis chapter 4, there are two worlds being lived for. You find Cain's descendants are living for this world. And you find Seth's descendants are living for the world to come what world are you living for i think of our life and the things we strain for we strain to get this house we strain to be able to get this car we strain to get this job we strain to do well at the job we 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 are putting effort for it we're waking up thinking about it we're getting up in the night, thinking about it, the things we use, just this week, what have you strained for? And I, and I just wonder, for me and for you, have we strained in our walk for the Lord Jesus? Have we strained for Jesus? Have we strained to know him more? Have we, have we have effort and straining, Lord, I want to serve you in a greater way? I was thinking this week about my own personal life and my time as I read this. I know I'm giving myself to the Lord in my time, but Am I worshiping the Lord and walk with him so my time is more powerful because of God's hand and presence on me? See, you can cross all the T's and dot the I's as far as you think in your effort, in your labor, and I show up for visitation and I'm here for this and that and the other, but are you walking with God so you're a powerful warrior and Christian to be used? If you're just showing up in your own strength, you may be spinning your wheels you're not, sharp, you're not a sharp axe ready to be used. You can be swinging that axe like crazy, and we are. We're all busy, time going. But are we serving God? And God has filled us, and the power is there. I'm just telling you about how it spoke to my heart. It stirred me maybe the same thing. The Lord will work in your heart. See, riches tend to blind our eyes. Those that have riches have a greater stake in this world. 
See, the poor person is easier to witness to because they don't have such a stake in this world. It's interesting, even rich people that retire, they find so much to do because it takes time to have wealth. It takes time to have houses and lands and things like that. That's why it's harder for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God than those that are poor because they are invested in this world and the things of this life. It doesn't have to be that way. It wasn't that way for Abraham. Riches did not have a hold of him. It's not wrong to have things of this world. What's wrong is for the things of this world to have a hold of you. But that's a very slippery slope. It's a very subtle thing. They get into our heart. They get a hold of us. Riches tend to blind our eyes to ultimate, eternal, and spiritual realities by anchoring us to the wrong world, the world of Cain, rather than the world to come, the world of Seth. Right there we find the beginning of the Bible. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 6. We're coming back to Mark. We're just going to turn to two places. Look at 1 Timothy 6. Now give me a little bit of latitude with the time, if you would. I didn't get up to preach till 10 to 8, okay? I don't want to miss this. I thought about trying to split this or something, but it's just one thought, really, the whole message. 1 Timothy chapter 6, would you help me? Look there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. I want you to notice the wording here, verse 9. But they that, what? Will be rich. Remember, Jesus said it's not the riches, it's those that trust in riches. There are people that don't have riches, but instead of trusting God, they pull out the credit card, you know. And so they still are trusting in what they can do and their resources. Keep reading. But they that will be rich fall in temptation and a snare. Our, our, our state's saying, let's bring the lottery in. Hey, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We were there to Wake America yesterday with our lawmakers in Montgomery. I sat and had lunch with the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama. And other men were at that same table. And in this, the table behind me, there was the lieutenant governor um, and uh, so on. But it, I'm just saying, I said the, I quoted that verse to them and talked about it. Of course, they're pro-life and, and they're, they're people that are against uh, the things we are against. He's a born-again Christian, told me how he got saved, the chief justice of Alabama. So glad to hear that. But regardless of all that, I want you to notice this. He says there, but they that will be rich fall into the temptation and a snare. The lottery is sin. If we bring lottery in, we're bringing sin to the people of Alabama. Well, they can go to Tennessee and Florida, spend that money, or Georgia. Let them go. I don't want to offer the sin to them. It's a reproach to any people. That's what the Bible says. And with that sin, this is one thing the, 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 um, Ben Dupree, who is the, uh, uh, the chief of staff for the, for the chief justice, said, he was sitting right there beside him, he said, you know, I, I was mentioning the family of sins that comes with gambling. The family of sins that comes is always drunkenness and prostitution. That's what comes with gambling. There's a family of sins there. And he says, yeah, one thing you many people don't think about is on the government side the gambling money that they have the house always wins they have the money and they begin to fund lobbyists like crazy to influence the state's laws because they have this money to push towards more sin to bring them more money he says i grew up in new york i saw it happen there pretty interesting that's not the message but this goes along with it snare into many foolish and hurtful us. Who? Those that will be rich. Which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money. Not money. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. None of those things can you see. It's all things that you cannot be seen. This is the true riches. This is the true reality. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Here's Paul speaking to a, 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 his, his son in the faith, Timothy, who is already committed to, uh, as, a, as a Christian, committed. He's now a, a pastor. He's a preacher. And yet Paul is warning of the deceitfulness and subtleness of riches and the love of money and the things of this life. It's not the riches that's the problem, but the will to be rich. It's not the money that's the problem, but the love 
of money and what it does. It's so subtle. It's so slick. You say, "Woo, I'm not rich. Like I said, if you live in America, you're rich. Why do you think we're so blinded, even as Christians? Number two, not only a, a love of comfort, but number two, a trust in riches. Notice verse 24. There's a material love, and then there's this misplaced trust. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said unto him, How hard is it for them that trust in riches, trust in riches, to enter into the kingdom of God, back in Mark 10, if you go back there. Notice that the Lord adds a word here that shows the subtlety of riches, those that come to trust in them. I quoted earlier in the service, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Here, this rich young ruler, he's trusting in riches. See, the love of money is the root of all evil. Refer to, the, 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 you see this letter that I wrote, or that I wrote, that I read, how it stirred me. He said some things here that just were, he says, the devil has convinced millions of God's children, God's warriors with unlimited potential, that their calling on earth is to make a good living, achieve a high level of comfort and attend church on Sunday. I wonder even as Christian parents, if we're not careful, we want our kids to make a good living so they can be comfortable and take care of their grandkids. Uh, Yeah, I want them to be in church, but how much of that is just a worldly desire? When he asks these questions here further in the letter, why are these regions still so dark? Is God at a loss? Is God bankrupt? Does he not have children he can send? Soldiers who will invade Satan's territories? We must conclude he's called many, but they've refused to go. They've been too busy, deceived into thinking that it's not their responsibility. This other thought he said here earlier, I thought it was good. We don't plan to sit on our laurels, but to push deeper and deeper to the enemy's territory until God orders our hearts to stop beating till death, he's saying. We do not plan to defend our territory, but to make the enemy defend his. Why wouldn't we? We cannot be beaten as long as we obey. That's what the Lord Jesus said. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're sometimes defending Christianity, defending our territory. He says, why? We ought to be invading, make him defend his. We have the power of God as we follow him. But because of deception, because of a misplaced trust, we're comfortable, we're busy, uh, we're swinging and, and battling. We're straining at different things, but it's not straining in the battle that the Lord has called us to. It's not in God's spiritual war. The unlimited power of God is, at our, uh, is, is our resource. It's at our fingertips, but we don't tap into it. You realize how much time it takes to keep up with and manage and tend to all the things that we have. Check up on uh, all the social media and all the friends and all the uh, check up on people's houses and, and get their car fixed and keep up with their 401k. I'm not against having those things. I think you should have some of that. But are we giving ourselves to the Lord? Is that our main focus? You don't have to be rich to trust in riches. How hard is it for Christians that trust in riches to serve God and have Christ's spirit? Verse 25, he talks about this easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And some people believe he's talking about this small gateway that a camel would have to get down on his knees and crawl through. Or we should talk about the eye of a needle that we're thinking of. Regardless, it's a miraculous thing. One thing that was interesting is I read someone talking about the eye of a needle, this gateway, is that in order to get the camel through there, you'd have to unpack everything off it. When you come to the Lord, you can't bring anything with you. You don't get to bring all your clothing and all the things that uh, make you up. Or all, No, no, you come before God with your naked self. He can see all. His eye discerns all. You, you can't bring all that stuff with you. That's what he said to this rich young ruler. Hey, leave all that. Come into through the straight gate, the narrow way, and come follow me. I'm the true rich. Riches. Me is what has all the riches of the Godhead bodily. It's all in him. Pretty interesting. Unpack the camel. Everything else is laws. Paul would say that. Everything else is, I count as dung. All that is a, it's a, it's a, it's not just a neutral, all that other stuff. It's a loss. Pretty amazing. 
Verse 26, they were astonished. Who then can be saved? They had a wrong notion of prosperity, equated godliness. And by the way, a lot of us have that idea. If someone's poor, they must not be godly. But God's, that's not what God says. Jesus said, hey, foxes have holes. The birds there have nests, but the Son of Man, I thought, where lays head. But he was able to give his all to the Lord. I'm not telling you to go sell your house. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not there to do that. I'm just saying, are we giving ourselves to the Lord? Is that where we're straining and putting our energy and effort? Verse 28, then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we've left all and followed thee. Peter sees the other side of the coin here. Lord, he gets to keep all of his. We gave up our business. We gave up everything to follow you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there's no man that left house, brethren, sisters, father, and mother. I don't want to get into it for the time's sake, but this or between each word is emphasizing each thing. And then in verse 30, having the and between each word. God knows how to use commas. But doing that and and the or between each like that, he's emphasizing each thing as, as individual and separate. For my sake and the gospels, he should receive a hundredfold now and this time. Houses and brethren, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. I got to thinking about Jesus. You know how many houses he stayed in? Nice places. I mean, he was in nice houses. He was in, hey, Matthew was a publican. He had a nice house and they all went there. Zacchaeus. He had lots of money, and they all went to that house. And Jesus stayed in all kinds of places and had sisters and mothers and, and, and things that he got to enjoy that he never owned. But God gave it to him because of his obedience to Christ. And Paul had the same thing where he stayed here and went there. Amazing where God will take you if you'll obey him and follow him. Uh, God gave all this to him. But it is interesting what the Bible says at the end there, verse uh, number 30. Well, before I say that, let me say this. I saw this bumper sticker. It said, put your money where your mouth is. Tithe if you love Jesus. Anybody can honk. I thought that was pretty funny. A lot of people I talk about much they love the Lord, but uh, put your money where your mouth is. Well, Peter said, we did. We we left all. We put our money where our mouth is. We're not just talking about it. We did. Except just in case someone says, well, I'll follow the Lord for all the benefits. It's interesting. God adds in here these two words in verse 30. And, and, and children and lands with persecutions. With persecutions. But he doesn't end with persecutions. Notice the ending. And in the world to come, eternal life. Hey, yes, there's persecution, but guess what's coming? Heaven. Heaven's coming. Oh, I love it. Verse 31 is the perspective of eternity. But many that are first shall be last. And the last should be first. The truth is, when everyone heard him preaching, they knew this. They watched the rich young ruler go away, and everyone watching it saw this and saw that rich young ruler, he's first. That rich young ruler, he's the man here. He was the first in the room. Now he's left. And Peter, when he spoke up, people looked at Peter and said, he's probably one of the last. He doesn't have much. But God was saying, They're looking at the human perspective, this world's perspective, but the world-to-come perspective, eternity's perspective, the first will be last, and the last will be first. If God could help us to see beyond while we're still living what is coming, again, our missionary to Central Asia has seen something that some of us need to see that most of us haven't seen, that this life is not about all that. God has places all over this world, not just around the world, but right here. People that you sit by and walk past that need to know the truth, and yet we're ashamed of God. We're afraid they're going to be embarrassed. The truth is we're afraid we're going to be embarrassed. And we forget what life is really about. If we could see this world on fire, if we could see this is is people going to hell fire, it's not blood and death we're talking about. This is their eternal soul. His eyes have been open to some things. Quite a letter. How often people live and die, and they had a good job, made a good career of it. They went to church faithfully, enjoyed certain leisures and had some hobbies. Die, good Christians, they they went to heaven. They were saved. But did they ever really give their all for Christ? Where was the straining that the lamb that was slain would receive the reward of his suffering. 
The next verse is beginning in verse 32. Jesus starts talking about where he's headed. The Bible says in the middle of 32, and he took again the 12 and began to tell them what things should happen unto them. Saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. He says, Behold, verse 33, saying, Behold. It's like he's clapping. Hey, listen up. Behold. This is what life is all about. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's urging the reader, give attention here. Behold. He's urging those hearing him. Behold, listen up. The rich young ruler, he chose jewels over me, but I've chosen the cross over the crown. I've left the crown for the cross. And it just made me think, how much attention have I given to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection this week? How much attention and on my day and my week and this month and 2020 have I given to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? This is the climax of all of history. This is the thing, the message that people need to hear. Just made me think, Lord, help me. We need to repent. I'm afraid we're going to find out one day that we're, we're last, not first. We've not given like we should. We're not like this woman calling people to her house who can't get out, 82, about to die, so she can witness to them. She's calling people over. This other that was beaten in front of his family as he's preaching the gospel. We're through two passages. Let's go there quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men and should be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Lord, have I endured hardness for you? Again, it doesn't mean you have to give away everything and be poor. That's not the hardness. Abraham didn't endure that hardness. Job didn't. David didn't. So gonna, it's, not, not, it's not just the poorness. But am I a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen to be a soldier. That was what was on the letter. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. How can I? I'm here to fight. I'm here in a battle. People's souls, eternal souls are at stake. And yet we've gotten caught up in Vanity Fair, if you've read Pilgrim's Progress. We never got out. We never moved on. Hebrews 6, last place. Hebrews 6, next. Hebrews 6, look at verse 9 through 12. There's a wonderful passage. I shared this with the staff on Monday. But, beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. You say, I'm saved. Praise the Lord. God says there's some things that ought to accompany salvation. Verse 10, Hebrews 6, 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work. How's your work for the Lord? And labor of love. How's your labor for the Lord? Which ye have showed toward his name. Some, most of us, too often, we're working for our name. We've labored for our name, but that's not what he's saying. Forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. How's your ministering going? And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He's going to make a little list of those people, Hebrews chapter 11 right? The hall of faith. We're following those that inherited the promises by their faith. Don't be slothful. Don't, don't, don't rest on your laurels as, as our missionary pleaded with us. But rather, verse 11, have the same diligence. We have full assurance of hope here. He says, for God's not unrighteous to forget this labor. Oh, may the Lord help us. Will you come and surrender all tonight? Or is there something of this world that still has a hold that you won't let go? Jesus said, let go of that stuff, the rich young ruler. He said, no, I won't. Come follow me. Get, surrender that. He wouldn't do it. He took jewels over Jesus.
a love of comfort rather than the love of Christ. A, a trust in riches rather than trusting in the Lord as a Savior. I know most of you are already saved here tonight. Like every one of you, I pretty much have heard your testimony. How about those things that accompany salvation? Can we bow with me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.